بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على من بعثه الله رحمة للعالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to embark on another chapter of Imam al Nawi's chapters from Riyadh al Salihin, that great book of his. Um, now, the chapter that he has, or he has a kitab, another, another he has dedicated a book, or a, uh, he says, Kitabu Adabu Nawm, which is the um, the book of the etiquettes of a gnome or sleeping. So in this chapter, he's actually, or in this book, he's actually going to look at not only the etiquettes of sleeping, but the etiquettes of lying down and sitting. So Alhamdulillah, as you know, Islam is a comprehensive way of life. It regulates every aspect of our lives. And this is from the, the blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal, is that He has sent us uh, prophets and messengers, scriptures, and we find through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu through the Quran and through the Sunnah, we learn even how to sleep and what is in our favor and what is best for us when it comes to uh, sleeping. Now, the chapter is Babu Ma Yaquluhu Inda Nawm. So, the first thing is going to touch on and um, explore is the hadith of what to say at the time of sleeping. So before you go to sleep, uh, there is a sunnah, or there are, there are sunan, there are things to do before you go to sleep. Things to say and things to do. So from amongst the things that Imam Munawi rahimahullah ta'ala has included in this chapter, he starts off with the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhuma. And in this hadith, Al-Bara ibn Azib, he says, whenever the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu went to bed, he would lie down on his right side and recite, and then he mentions a dua. So the first thing we're learning now, the sunnah, when you come to go to sleep, is to sleep on your right hand side. It's to sleep on your right hand side. Not on your back, not on your stomach, and not on your left. Um, so every Muslim should make an effort and get into the habit of sleeping on the right hand side. It is number one, better for your back. Number two, it's also better for your heart. Your heart, there's not so much pressure on your heart. Uh, likewise, um, it is also the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you are being rewarded from in, in many ways, physically and spiritually, inshallah ta'ala. And there has been um, studies that show the, um, the significance or the, the virtue or the merit of sleeping on your right hand side. And subhanAllah, those of you who may have done you know, first aid, you, one of the, you know, the practices of first aid is when you have a person who's injured, you know, if you are resuscitating them or you're doing some sort of procedure, procedure to them, to always bring them back to their right hand side, to their side. And the breathing is much more better um, for the person who is sleeping on their right hand side. Now, here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Al-Bara ibn Azib is uh, stating, he, would, he taught them a dua to say at the time of sleeping. Now this dua, you will find it in the book Fortress of the Muslim, Husn al-Muslim, or if you look it up, um, on the internet, dua before sleeping. This is the dua that we find in Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilayk, wa wajjahtu wajhi ilayk, wa fawadtu amri ilayk, wa aljahtu zahri ilayk, rahbatan wa rahbatan ilayk, la malja'a wa la manja illa ilayk, amantu bikitabika alladhi anzalt, so the translation of this hadith or this dua, O oh Allah, I have submitted myself to you. Because you see, uh, sleep is a minor death. When you sleep, they call it the, the minor death. Um, and basically what you were do, doing now at the time of sleep, you are uh, reviving 
you are reviving your commitment to your faith and to Allah Azza wa Jal. So you were saying, Oh Allah, I have submitted myself to you. Aslamt. Islam, as we know, is submission. Islam means submission and surrender and obedience. So, uh, Oh Allah, I have submitted myself to you. I have turned my face to you, committed my face to you, and depend on you for protection out of desire for you and out of fear of you. There is no refuge and no place of safety from you but with you. I believed in the book you have revealed and in the Prophet you have sent. In other words, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, um, it is Allah Azza wa Jal who returns back your spirit that is just clinging, your ruh that is just clinging, that is just suspended from your body. If Allah Azza wa Jal wants, He can uh, refrain from, He can allow or decree for your ruh, for your spirit not to return to your body. And so therefore you will die. So here, if you do die, then what, what a beautiful way to die having said these words. The last of your words before meeting Allah Azza wa Jal with these words. And there are many people who do die in their sleep and they don't wake up. So I think it's a very important dua. It's sunnah, very beneficial dua. It's a dua that reminds us also of uh, putting our trust and our dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there is another narration regarding this dua or that includes this dua that we find in Bukhari and Muslim. Um, also the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib. But in this narration, he says, إذا, the, Prophet, the Prophet said, إِذَا أَتَيْتَ مَجْجَعَكَ فَتَوَضَّأْ وُضُوءَكَ لِلصَّلَةِ ثُمَّ اتَّجِعْ عَلَى شِقِّكَ الْأَيْمَنْ وَقُلْ So here we have an addition whereby the Prophet says to him, and perform wudu. So now, the sunnah is to sleep on your right. The sunnah is to say the uh, words, the words of dhikr that we just said. And the sunnah is to sleep in a state of wudu. The sunnah is to sleep in a state of wudu. Um, so he mentioned uh, the dua and he mentioned it again in this uh, hadith. So it is from the sunnah that wudu is not only for salah, but wudu is also for recitation of the Qur'an. Wudu is also required for circulating the Kaaba. Okay? And wudu is something which is very refreshing and very rejuvenating, where you are um, rejuvenating uh, yourself, uh, inshallah ta'ala, and especially when you are feeling, if you're feeling very tired, very lethargic, you know, wudu, the actions of wudu, massaging your, you know, your, the, 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 the limbs of your body of wudu is very, very um, beneficial for you. The next hadith is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that we find in Bukhari and we find in Sahih Muslim. It's, uh, she says, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يصلي من الليل إحدى عشرة ركعة فإذا طلع الفجر صلى ركعتين خفيفتين ثم اتجع على شقه الأيمن حتى يجيء المؤذن فيؤذن فيؤ uh, oh, so here the Prophet وسلم, or Aisha says that the Prophet وسلم, he used to offer 11 rak'at of optional salat optional salat um, in the latter part of the night when it was about dawn he would offer two short rak'at and then would lie down on his right side till the mu'addin that is the caller of the prayer um, would come to inform him that the congregation had gathered for prayer. So, a number of things that we can deduce from this hadith. The first thing, the Prophet ﷺ would pray night prayers. So yes, we have our five daily prayers. Salatul Fajri, or Subuh, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. And the associated Sunan prayers, which are known as the Rawatib, such as the two before Fajr, the four before Dhuhr, the two after Dhuhr, the two after Maghrib, the two after Isha, they're called Rawatib, Ratiba, each one's a Ratiba. Then we have the Sunnah, the Sunnah or the Sunan prayers, which are things like Salatul Witr, the last prayer of the night before you go to sleep, preferably, Salatul Duha in the morning, um, Salat uh, Tahajjud is one of them, Salatul Tahajjud which is during the night. So. 
Here the Aisha is saying, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed at 11. Then what he would do, when the time for the... And he, he prayed them in the latter part of the night. The sunnah, the best time to pray the tahajjud or the qiyam is in the third part of the night. And it may be an hour or two before Salatul Fajr. You get up and this is when Allah Azza wa Jal descends to the lowest heaven in a manner which befits His Majesty. And He answers the supplication of the supplicator, of the one who's calling upon Allah Azza wa Jal. So if you have a mas'ala, if you have anything that you need, then this is the time to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. One of the best times to make dua. Um, so I do um, remind myself and remind you all about the sunnah of tahajjud prayer at night, waking up while everybody is asleep and turning to Allah Azza wa Jal. Now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when um, he would offer the uh, rak'atan of sunnah of the fajr, and then he would lie on his right hand side, he would lie down and wait for the mother to tell him, the call to pray to tell him, look, the people have gathered now, come and lead the prayer. So, um, the, it is, if, and the sunnah is to pray the sunnah prayer of fajr at home. If you are one who was praying fajr at the masjid, then the sunnah is to pray your two sunnah prayer, al qabliya or the, those two rak'at that come before the fajr, that you pray them in your home. That's the sunnah. And then to come to the masjid and join the imam with the fard prayer. Now of course if you come to the masjid and you come earlier than the imam's arrival, then you still have to pray two sunnah, which is known as tahiyyatul masjid. Two rak'at, which are the tahiyyah, the greeting of the masjid. And then if, however, if you have come to the masjid and you haven't prayed your two sunnah prayers that are um, of the fajr, then you can pray with the intention of the fajr, sunnah prayer, and include in that would be tahiyyatul masjid. You don't have to pray two lots of prayers. So you don't have to pray tahiyyatul masjid and then two rak'at of sunnah for the fajr. Suffice, or what suffices would be uh, the two rak'at of sunnah of the fajr prayer before you sit down and wait for the imam to lead the congregational prayer of fajr. Um, now we move on to the next uh, hadith that Imam al nawi included. And this is another sunnah whereby the Prophet Sallallahu he would place his right hand under his cheek when going to sleep. Another sunnah. And he would also make another dua that we can learn here, a shorter dua. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu wa ardan, as we find in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said that whenever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he lay down for sleep at night, he would place his right hand under his right cheek. And he would supplicate. And he would say, Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. So maybe the other dua you might be thinking was too long. Tayyib, in the meantime, as you're practicing the other one, this one's a very short one. Bismik Allahumma, which means, in the name of Allah, or O oh Allah, with your name, will I die and live in other words, I will wake up. So that's when you go to bed, you say, Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. Because we said that uh, sleep is a minor death. And when you wake up, or in the narration it says, and when he woke up, he would supplicate, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alhamdulillahi alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah, subhanallah, imagine that. As soon as you open your eyes, as soon as you are awake, the first thing that you do is you remember Allah Azza wa Jal. The first thing that you do, Allahu Akbar. You wake up and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is what? Alhamdulillah. It's like you're praising Allah Azza wa Jal for having returned back your soul. You're thanking Him for giving you another chance, another day. Another day, not only to make another dollar, but to make hasanat, to have rewards from Allah Azza wa Jal, to be able to worship Him. Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana, the one who brought us back to life. 
بَعْدَمَا أَمَاتَنَا After he has caused us to die, وَإِلَيْهِ النُّشُورِ And to him is the return. Nushur meaning the return is to Allah Azza wa Jal. So, this is another hadith that Imam Al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala included from us the etiquettes of sleeping. The next hadith is basically condemning a condemnation of sleeping on your stomach. For those of you who ha- are in the habit or have got into the habit and enjoy sleeping on your stomach. In this next hadith, um, it's the hadith of Ya'ish ibn Tikhfa al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu qal. Um, he says that my father said, I was lying down on my belly in the mosque or in the masjid when someone shook me with his foot. He's lying down on the, on, on, in the masjid on his stomach. Someone gave him a bit of a nudge with his foot. Uh, and he said, lying down this way is disapproved by Allah. Lying down this way is disapproved by Allah. I looked up and who did he see? It was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I wish it was me that he was, you know, that he was doing that too. Um, but in any way, in any case, um, I looked up and he saw the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying to him that... Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disapproves this. And this hadith, we find it in Sunan Abi Dawood. And like I said to you, subhanAllah, Islam disapproves it. And scientifically, science has shown us how this sleep is not good for your back long term. Not good for your heart. Um, now, this next hadith that Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala included is an encouragement to always remember Allah azza wa jal, irrespective of the position that you were in, whether you were standing, whether you were sitting, whether you were driving, whether you were lying down. It's the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa arda that is also found in Sunan Abi Dawood. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever sits in a place where he does not remember Allah ta'ala, he will suffer loss and incur displeasure of Allah. And whoever lies down, in a place where he does not remember Allah, he will suffer sorrow and incur displeasure of Allah. So even when you are lying down, you should remember Allah Azza wa Jal. Otherwise you're missing out. You're missing out. A Muslim is always remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. A, mu- a Muslim's tongue is always moist with the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why we have words of remembrance for almost every aspect or every condition or every situation of our life. We have a dua that you say as you just heard before you go to sleep, when you wake up, when you leave your home, when you enter your home, before you enter the bathroom even, when you leave the bathroom, before you have intimate relations, when you get in the car to drive, before you enter the masjid, when you leave the masjid, when somebody dies. There is a dua for every situation, every condition, when somebody has a newborn, when you are traveling. Subhanallah. And the list goes on and on and on. And if you are interested in Shalat Ta'ala, and so you should be interested in Shalat Ta'ala, I advise you to Google up or to search Fortress of the Muslim. You can get a soft copy. Memorize. Memorize what to say before you eat, when you finish eating. If you forget, if you forget what to say at the beginning of yani, food or drink, what to say when it rains, what to say when you, when you hear the thunder, so these are all the things, what to say when uh, you see somebody who has a disability and you want to praise Allah that it's not hasn't happened to you and thank Allah for your sound and good condition. So Alhamdulillah, Muslim remembers Allah Azza wa Jal always. He remembers Him sitting, standing, in any position. Otherwise you are incurring a loss as this hadith has signified. Now, Imam Al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala he moves on to the next chapter, manners of lying down on one's back and placing one's leg upon the other. But before I go into this etiquette, I want to just touch on a few things related to sleep. And that is, the sunnah when you go to sleep, as we said, the first thing we spoke about, is to sleep on your right hand side. To sleep in a state of wudu. To sleep saying the adhkar, the supplications, 
Now also, we learn from the sunnah, before you go to sleep, and also of course, the sunnah was to have your right hand under your right cheek, is to also recite Ayatul Kursi. When you recite Ayatul Kursi, chapter 2 from the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, verse 255, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. This ayah is known as the greatest verse, the greatest ayah in the Quran. And in the hadith that is found in Bukhari, we learn that shaitan, shaitan cannot or finds it very hard to approach a person and to engage in foul play with a person who has recited the greatest ayah in the Quran, ayatul kursi. It's very simple to learn. So the sunnah is to recite it also before going to sleep. The sunnah is also to gather the two palms of your hand and to blow in your palms whilst reciting the three quls. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ And قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ And قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ So you recite while blowing one time each Upon completion of Surah Al-Nas, you wipe your head. You wipe the front parts of your body. Front parts only. And then you repeat this a second time. And then you repeat this a third time. And that is the sunnah also. Protect yourself. Fortify yourself from the evil that may be lurking. So, the sunnah is, Ayat Al-Kursi, the three quls, the two dua that we mentioned, this is a recipe of protection, a recipe of praise that can ensure your protection inshallah ta'ala. So also, if a person has a bad dream while they are sleeping, the sunnah is to sit up, to turn, to say, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim Seek refuge in Allah from the rejected and cursed Satan, from the devil, from shaitan, and to turn to your left, and to spittle three times. Three times. If your wife or husband is there, just be careful. You don't want to yani, you know, wake, make them wake up and say, you know, it's too early for a shower. <laughs> so, um, this is from the shaitan and the Prophet ﷺ said to also sleep on the other side then. So even if you are sleeping on your right, here the sunnah is to change positions. There must be a wisdom. There is a wisdom behind it. Change positions. So again, if you have a bad dream, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Spittle to your left hand side and change positions. And inshaAllah ta'ala, you will not be harmed. The ulama have also spoken about, okay, how is it that some people have recited Ayat al-Kursi and fortified themselves, yet they will still have Yet they will still have a bad dream. It could be that you got up at night to go to the bathroom, to the lavatory, to the toilet. And you came back to your bed and you didn't recite Ayat al-Kursi again. So the sunnah would be to recite it again. Because now you've unbroken that shield by going to the bathroom. You've done some activity. You've done something. You've come back to bed. And so fortify yourself again when you go to sleep. This is something to keep in mind, inshallah ta'ala. Another sunnah that a lot of Muslims may or may not know, is that there is a hadith that we find in Sunan and Nasa'i related to tossing and turning. Some of us, we might have one of those nights whereby we wake up and we just toss and turn. We can't fall asleep. There is a dua, there is a formula, a prophetic hadith. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us to say, La ilaha illallah, subhanahu wa tawheed always, always putting trust in Allah azza wa jal. La ilaha illallah, al-wahidul qahhar, al-wahidul qahhar, rabbu samawati wal-ard, wa ma baynahum al-aziz al This is the hadith. La ilaha illallah, al-wahidul qahhar, rabbu samawati wal-ard, wa ma baynahum al-aziz al So this is what you say as well, 
if you are tossing and turning at night and you will find this hadith in fortress of the Muslim. Hasn al-Muslim. So these are some of the etiquettes that we should be mindful of when it comes to sleep. Um, the next chapter that Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala included are manners of lying down on one's back and placing one leg upon the other. The hadith he has included here is found in Bukhari Muslim, hadith Abdullah ibn Zayd radiallahu anhuma. I saw the messenger of Allah وسلم, lying down on his back in the mosque, placing one leg on the other. So there's no problem if you're just lying down. Okay, having one leg over the other. But when it comes to sleeping, we said sleeping should be on your right hand side. Another hadith that we find in Sunan Abi Dawood, Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu reported that after Fajr, after the Fajr Salat, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to sit cross-legged in the same place in which he had prayed until the sun shone brightly. So the sunnah is, after you, if you're praying in the masjid, you've completed the salah, stay in your place, stay in your place of prayer, and recite your, your adhkar, your morning supplications, your wird, your remembrance of Allah, in that position until the sun rises. And then wait a little bit and then pray your two rak'at of sunnah. The Prophet wasallam he said, whoever prays salatul fajr in jama'ah, whoever prays subuh in congregation, and then he sits and he remembers Allah until the sun rises. And then he prays two rak'at, which are known as either ishraq, salatul ishraq, or salatul duha, and there is some difference of opinion amongst the ulama, then it will be recorded for him as if he has performed Hajj and Umrah, Tamma, 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 complete, complete, complete. This is the virtue of doing that. Some of the ulama said, to get this reward, you have to ha stay in the same position. Others said, there's no problem if you go to another place within the masjid. But some ulama go to the extent that you stay in the same spot. And this is what we see in this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu he never moved away according to this hadith. He stayed in his place, in the same place. في مجلسه حتى تطلع الشمس حسناء Until it rose and it was bright. So it was at least a spear's length above the horizon. The next hadith is the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sitting in the compound of the Holy Kaaba with the thighs or with the, his thighs against the stomach and arms around his legs. You know when you have your, your, your legs up and you hugging your shins or your feet, your thighs are against your stomach. This jalsa, this type of sitting, the Prophet has been, sit, has been seen in this sitting position. Um, in the hadith of Qayla bint Makhrama radiallahu anha, she said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu seated with his arms enfolding his legs and when I saw him in such a state of humble guise, I trembled with fear due to the awe he showed in that posture. This is a hadith that is found in Tirmidhi. Um, there is also a hadith which prohibits us from sitting in a way that is known to the Jews. And in this hadith, the hadith that is found in Abu Dawood, it's the hadith of Al-Sharid Al ibn Suwaid radiallahu anhu, who said, the Messenger of Allah passed by me when I was sitting with my left hand behind my back and leaning on my palm. You know when people like, you sit on the floor and you have your hand out and you lean on your left hand and your palm. This sort of sitting, the Prophet ﷺ, he spoke out against it. And it happens sometimes and you're not even conscious of it. It happens to all of us. You might be sitting, you might do it on your right, you might do it on your left. Well, if you're doing it on your left, the Prophet ﷺ, on seeing this man, he said, do 
do you sit like those who the wrath of Allah has descended? He said, أَتَقْعُدُ قِعْدَةَ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Do you sit the sitting? Qi'data is the sitting. Qa'ada he sits. So this hadith, as I said, is found in Sunan Abi Dawood and it's an authentic uh, hadith. Um, the next hadith or the next chapter that Imam al Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala included is etiquette of attending company and sitting with companions. Here he mentions the hadith that is found in Bukhari and Muslim, Hadith ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Do not ask someone to give up his seat in order to take it, but make accommodation wide and sit at ease. It was Ibn Umar's habit that if a person left his seat for him, he would not take it. So don't make somebody get up out of their seat for you. This is the sunnah. If you come to a place, everybody sitting down and say, Can you please get up? I want to sit there. This is against Islam. Okay? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, or radiallahu anhu ma, may Allah be pleased with him, and his father Umar, he would refuse, even if he came to a majlis, to a gathering, and somebody stood out of their place, stood up from their place, and they said, here, you come and sit here. He said, no, no, you sitting here, you stay here. You see the akhlaq. You see the manners, you see the humbleness. This is what Islam teaches us. The ulama, however, did speak out and they said, they said the only time there'll be an exception would be, for example, if you were sitting in a teacher's position. This is the teacher, he sits there. This is his place because everybody, all the students, they know that that's where he sits. It would not be befitting them for him to sit elsewhere. The students are not used to that. So they said this would be an exception but again, this hadith yani, throws uh, light on even how where, yani, we should sit and, where sh and, and we shouldn't yani, get a person out of their place. Also, let's say for example, sometimes this happens. You leave your seat to go make wudu. Or you leave your seat to go and get something that you have forgotten to come back to your seat. What is the sunnah? Can someone take that place? Are you allowed to come back to that place? And in this hadith, the hadith of Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhuma, that he reports that whenever we came to the gathering of the Prophet we would sit down at the end of the assembly. Well actually before that, the, before this hadith, hadith Abu Huraira sorry, radiallahu anhu, إِذَا قَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ يَقُولُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِذَا قَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ مِنْ مَجْلِسٍ ثُمَّ رَجَعَ إِلَيْهِ فَهُوَ أَحَقُّ بِهِ فَهُوَ أَحَقُّ بِهِ He said that if someone leaves his seat for one reason, for one reason or another, in other words, and he returns to it, he is better entitled to it. رواه مسلم. The hadith is found صحيح مسلم. An authentic hadith. So you can leave your seat. And you should be able to come back to find your seat. But unfortunately, if people don't know the sunnah, then they might be, it, become, it might become problematic. And also in the hadith that I just read earlier, hadith Jabir, that whenever we came to the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ, we would sit down at the end. So you don't go crossing people and just to get to the front. Khalas, يعني, if the rows have been formed and the circles formed, come to the end. Come to the end. You came at the end, you came last, you came you know, later. Then take your place that's next available in the gathering. Um, from amongst the etiquettes of Jumu'ah that we learned in this next hadith, Hadith Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, if a man takes a bath on Friday, purifies himself thoroughly, uses oil and perfume which is available in the house, sets forth for the masjid, does not forcibly sit between two persons, offers the prayer that is prescribed for him, and listens to the Imam. Silently, his sins between this Friday and the previous Friday will be forgiven. Rawahul Bukhari. 
So in this hadith that is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, we learn a number of etiquettes that are specific for Yawm al-Jumu'ah, the Sunnah. What is the Sunnah for Yawm al-Jumu'ah? Number one is to take a bath. Some ulama said it's mandub or Sunnah, and others said that it is wajib. But when we look at the hadith, it seems to be more like a wajib. It seems as though it is more wajib upon the males who are performing, who are going to perform Salat al-Jumu'ah, to take a bath before they go to Jumu'ah. Or on the day of Jum'ah, before the Salat al-Jum'ah, before the Salat, so that you don't harm people with your bodily odors. So, the Sunnah number one on Jum'ah is to have a bath, to bathe or to bath on Friday, to apply perfume. This is for the males. To apply, uh, to, uh, uh, use oil and perfume that's available that you have. Um, the next Sunnah is to not sit between two people, not to... You know, these two people might be friends, they've come together. Don't separate between two. Two people. But sit where, is, where there is an available spot. Um, also to listen. Oh, to offer, he said, and to offer the prayer. To, uh, the off, the off, to offer the prayer here is Tahir al Masjid. So when you come to the Masjid on Friday, even if the Imam is giving the khutbah, even if the Imam is giving the sermon, do not sit down until you have prayed two rak'at of sunnah. One day, a man entered the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ was given the khutbah and he sat down. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Qum, he commanded him to stand up and to pray two rak'at. So the sunnah is to not sit down until you've prayed. Some people what they do, they wait until the second khutbah of the imam and then, or when he says, Aqulu qawli hadha, or what's that effect? Then they stand up and then they continue. Um, uh, they pray to the God. This is not the sunnah. You see this in many masajid. The sunnah is when you come to the masjid to pray to the God and then to sit down. And to pray to the masjid. So here this hadith is telling us this. And in this hadith to also uh, listen. To listen, to keep, to keep silent to keep quiet um, and listen attentively, not only to hear the Imam, but to listen to the Imam. Listen, learn. 52 Jumu'ahs a year, 52 lessons. And if you listen attentively, you might learn a thing or two. It might increase your Iman. It might, you know, give you an Iman rush. Or it may, you know, benefit you in one way or another, something that you've missed. It is not even allowed, it is not allowed to say to the person who might be talking or distracting the Jum'ah, keep silent, be quiet, shh. You can't do this even. You will, you will reduce the, the reward. For those who maybe have to, um, that need things done, then maybe you can before the Jum'ah, teach the minors, teach the kids who are under the age of puberty, to fiddle and to do those things that need to be done, whether it's a microphone, whether it's volume, whether it's, you know, attending some matter that's related to the congregation, get the minors to do it. Something to think about, inshallah ta'ala. So, and what's the reward if you do all this? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does all of this, the sins that he committed between one Jum'ah, between that Jum'ah and the previous Jum'ah, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ الْجُمْعَةِ الْأُخْرَى Between that Jum'ah, which is, could be the previous or could be the latter Jum'ah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, also, we have another hadith related to sitting, which is found in Sunan Abi Dawood, and it is the hadith of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, anna Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم لعن من جلس وسط الحلقة لعن من جلس وسط الحلقة that the prophet he said whoever takes seat at the, in the midst of an assembly has been cursed by the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم curses the one who sits in the middle of people's circle and the hadith is found in Abu Dawood. So you know how sometimes you might be sitting around in a circle. 
you are not allowed to sit in the middle of the circle. Sit at the end of the circle. But don't sit within the circle. And there is a curse here that the Prophet ﷺ has um, stated. So it must, it's a major issue. It's not something to be taken lightly. So don't sit. If, if you see children in a circle and someone sitting in the middle, this is not from the teachings of Islam. It is against that. And in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu anhu, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa saying, the best assemblies are those in which people make room for one another. Make room. Be considerate. Think about your Muslim brothers and sisters who are in that gathering. Whether it be a lecture, whether it be Friday prayer, whether it be a lesson. Be considerate. And think of others always, inshallah ta'ala. Um, we also have what's known as kafaratul majlis. When you leave a gathering, if you were sitting down, for example, and socializing and talking about the dunya and this and all that, sometimes we say some things that are wrong. We may have spoken about somebody. There is a dua or a sunnah or a hadith that you say before you leave that gathering that will uh, expiate, that will wipe away the sins of that gathering. And it's the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa arda that we find in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to say, before you leave that majlis, before you leave that gathering, to say, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Again, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, that illa ghufir lahu ma kana fi majlisihi dhalik. If you say that, that you will have forgiven what was said in that in that majlis. From of course this is referring to the minor sins, not the major sins, because major sins have their own specific conditions. Um, the last hadith that I want to mention that Imam al Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala included is the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa arda that we find in Sunan al Tirmidhi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whenever a group of people sit in a gathering in which they do not remember Allah the Exalted, nor supplicate to elevate the rank of their Prophet, such a gathering will be a cause of grief to them. If Allah wills, He will punish them. And if Allah wills, He will forgive them. So again, in any gathering, make sure you mention Allah Azza wa Jal's name. Make sure you say Alhamdulillah. Make sure you say Wassalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah. Wallahu Ta'ala A'lam. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته